Today it gives me great pleasure to introduce a fabulous speaker. He uh, calls himself a motivational speaker with a very can-do attitude. As you will hear from him, he's been involved in many things which have shaped our lives in the recent past. So I don't want to steal his thunder, but I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, Roy Klein. Well, thank you. Now, can everyone hear me okay? Everybody, okay. In the back, you can hear me fine. No one brought any tomatoes with them, right? Nobody has a tomato? Good, okay. I'm safe. I'm safe. Well, let me introduce myself. Uh, by the way, I'm not really a motivational speaker. My speaking is more or less inspirational. Um, and I, I give out lots of facts and tell lots of interesting stories. Let me just adjust this. A lot of people would like to know, so Ron, how long have you been here? You know, are you a neighbor? You know, who are you? I've been here for 18 years with my lovely wife, Arlene, of 53 years, and no scars. And um, we lived, uh, prior to here, we lived in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And most people, well, we lived in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and then Moorestown, New Jersey. Not Morristown, but Moorestown. And most people will say, well, you're from Jersey. What exit? Well, I was from exit four. Anybody else from New Jersey here? Okay, where were you from? Exit seven, exit eight? Exit 10. <laughs> okay, well I'm from exit four, so now you know me. I introduced myself before as um, being very excited when, um, when Judy asked me to speak. I was extremely excited because she said, Ron, you're gonna be speaking to seniors in the same class that you are. And I figured, wow, how exciting. And then I figured out, you know, there are two classes of senior citizens, in case you didn't know that. There's the old people and those like us who've had a lot of birthdays. So we're in an entirely different class. So I'm going to speak to you as my contemporaries who've had a lot of birthdays. Uh, I'm still a pediatric. I'm only 77, so I apologize for that. But I do have a stick. And I have hearing aids, too. So I'm, I'm in good shape. So we're all together. Uh, I do have a little cheat sheet here that I might glance down to every once in a while because normally I speak to lots of corporations and that's kind of, you know, stale, but this is good. We have the quality of life that others don't have because we're, we're listeners. We learn, we're, we're aware, we're always paying attention. So that quality is there and that's what's so great about us. And when I say us, the ones that have had a lot of birthdays. And it's so important to, it becomes, we're interesting to others because we gather knowledge, we listen, you're here to learn, and learn other things that uh, would be interesting to you today and to maybe even be interesting to your grandchildren. They'll say, Mama, and pop up, you know that? We didn't realize that you knew that. So I'm gonna start out with a little story as to why you have to be aware, why you have to pay attention. And it's kind of, it's not a joke, but it's a little story. There were three people that were going to go shopping at the mall. I think it was um, Southgate? Yeah, it was Southgate. And they drove up in their car, and it was two men and a very perceptive woman. And they locked the car to get out to go shopping, and the man, the driver, says, oh, no, oh, hey. I locked the keys in the car. He said, you know what, I'll go get a coat hanger, and I'll try and open up the window and get that little thing to pop up and I'll get the keys. And his passenger said, don't do that. He said, that'll look like we're trying to steal the car. He said, I have a better idea. I'll break the little back window. I'll reach in, grab the keys, we're good. And the driver said, that'll really look like we're trying to steal the car. The perceptive woman walked up and said, you know, I don't know what you two guys are gonna do, but you better do it quick because it's starting to rain and the top is down. <laughs> This is why you have to pay attention, okay? So everybody got that, okay? All right, so I told that joke. Now, the other thing, because I, I know you wanna get into the good stuff. I don't focus on adversities, and I preach to everyone, don't focus on adversity, because the one standing next to you or sitting next to you, their problem's worse than mine, and my problem's worse than theirs. And their pro so we don't focus on the adversities. And the fact that I carry a stick invites me into all the senior residents. I enjoy speaking to the seniors and the, the ones in assisted living because 
they have, and I congratulate them when I walk in there because they have quantity. How wonderful. But you've got to put that quality back in life. And the way I preach that is I teach them things and I keep them up. And the one thing, most of them don't even know how to walk with a cane. And I say, well, here's the way you walk with a cane. How many people here realize that if I have pain in my right foot, I lead with my right foot and put the cane in my left hand. So this is the way you walk with the cane. If you have problems in your right foot, you lead with the foot and the cane at the same time. So there's something you may have learned today that you didn't know. And I tell the seniors this and those in the sisters living, I show them how to exercise, how to walk with their walkers. Most of them lean on the walker like this. You don't do that. The walker is just to keep you upright. So there's always something to learn every day. And then I tell them about my story. I have an inoperable spine condition. No big deal. I'm in pain constantly, but I've taught my brain to handle the pain. So again, nobody wants to hear me quetch. Nobody wants to hear my problems. So I walk with a stick and I make it like I don't even have any pain. And this is what I preach to others. So it's so important to have that positive, can-do attitude and not think about adversities. Now, my whole philosophy on life is to keep things simple. It drives my wife nuts. Because she says, Brian, when will you be back? Oh, soon. How long will you be? Oh, not long. Is it easy? Yeah, it's easy. So I drive her nuts with that. So with this constant, positive, easy attitude, and I learned this probably years ago when I went to grade school. And you learned the same thing. These, these old uh, word problems that we would get. And you'd have to simplify them to make, them, to make sense. The word problems, a, a woman driving in a car 50 miles an hour, that's good. And it had silver hubcaps, who cares? She was wearing a, a feathered cap and just a lot of superfluous information, nonsense. You have to simplify everything in life. What's the given? Well, she was in a car driving 50 miles an hour, and they wanted to know how long it's going to take to get somewhere. So it's what's the given, and what's the solution you're looking for? And this is the way you have to treat everything in life. So now here comes a story. I'm going to put this down for a second. Somewhere in this pocket, anybody ever see one of those? Yeah. And on the back? You know, it's got that stripe and everything. Years ago, they used to call it a charge card. And then I decided to have an effect on everybody's life in this room. So back in the early 60s, I invented the magnetic strip on the back of the card. How about that? Isn't that interesting? Now, I don't know if that's good or bad. I know the women love me, but I'm not sure about the guys. So that, that was one of the things. And here's the interesting story. Do you remember, and I know everybody remembers because I, I remember it too, when you'd go in to make a charge purchase, they didn't even call it a credit card purchase, they called it, you were going to use your charge card. You went into the merchant, you gave him this piece of plastic with your name on it and the number embossed on it, and he went through this long list of numbers to see if your number was on that long list. And that was a list of negative account numbers. And every month the credit card companies would come up with this long list of these negative numbers and at holiday time it would drive people nuts because he'd have to go through this long list. And a very a director of a very large department store came to the company where I was working and they said, we've got this problem, isn't there a solution? And they said, well give it to the idea guy. So I looked at it and I said, okay, word problems from high school. Is it a car, black car with silver hubcaps, this and that? What's the given? And the given was negative account numbers. And what's the solution we're looking for? We want to speed things up. So I thought about it for a while and I said, OK, I've got it. I'm going to take all those negative numbers, put those into a memory system somewhere, and then make a little keypad with account so they can key in the, the account number and put that down at the point of sale. And when somebody came in, they would key in the account number if it didn't show up in the memory system, the credit was good to go. So that was great. Then I figured, well, that's all right.
but we've got to put some smarts in that little piece of plastic. Now, right around that time, do you remember the old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders? And they were pretty interesting. If you'd run it real fast, it would sound like Mickey Mouse. And if you drag the, the tape, it would sound like Dracula. Well, I figured, geez, that's an interesting principle. Because if I could take a little piece of that tape and paste it on the back of that plastic card and then build a, a device that mimicked a tape recorder, mimicked it, OK? And what, how would it mimic it? If you take the card and you shove it in the slot slow, and then you pull it out fast so it would look like a tape recorder, it would read the tape. So I went to one of the largest manufacturers of the cards and I said, can you impregnate some magnetic material on the back of the card? And they said, yeah, we think we can do so. And it worked. So every time you go and try and zap that card through or push it in the slot and pull it out fast, you're mimicking a tape recorder. Isn't that interesting? So now when your grandkids say, you know, do you know kids why you swipe that thing through so, so fast? And they'll say, no, we don't know, my mom. Well, you do it because it wants to look like a tape recorder. Now, you ask, Ron, that's pretty good. How, how did it survive for 46 years? I mean, there's so many newfangled things out there, so many interesting devices and electronic devices. How did this silly invention survive after all these years? Anybody have an idea? Yes. No, it's a little bit more interesting than that. Anybody else have any ideas? It doesn't require energy. And if it doesn't require energy, it doesn't radiate. And if it doesn't radiate, somebody can't come up behind you with a scanner and take your credit card information. So how about that? Isn't that interesting? So that was the invention of the magnetic strip on a credit card. Now, I'm sure, I know there's questions that people always ask me about that. So I'm going to give you a minute or two to ask me, who was it that came to you, right? Who was it that wanted you to, to come up with that idea? And it was a little company called Macy's. Have you ever heard of them? <laughs> and there's an interesting story that goes with that, because for a couple of years, we were installing at Macy's to get this thing going. And I'm an animal lover. My wife's an advocate animal lover, and we love animals. And I had to be there after hours, because this whole new idea and concept was going to be installed in New York at Macy's. And we were going to try it out. So in doing that, who knew that after hours, they had these Dobermans, these protective dogs, riding up and down the, riding up and down the elevators. So here I am with the equipment. And one night, the doors open. And guess who was greeting me? Not Mr. Macy, but Mr. Dog. Well, anyway, because I'm an animal lover, I made friends with all the dogs. And it was a, it was a good story at the end. So then I, I felt so good about myself, I decided I was going to start my own company. And then I was, because they said, well, Ron's got ideas. He can come up with all these great ideas and, and maybe answer lots of questions. So I started a company. And um, needless to say, we needed money and we had to grow and so on and so forth. So I didn't know the difference between a public offering and a manhole cover. So I figured there must be a book you can read somewhere. And somebody said, well, there's this Security Act book from 1934. If you look in that book, it should answer all the questions. Well, I read it cover to cover, and I became an expert on public offerings. So I raised some money and started a company and then came up with ideas. And one of the ideas, has anybody ever bought a house? Anybody else ever bought a house? Did you ever hear of a thing called MLS, Multiple Listing Service? You like it? That worked pretty good. And that got my name on the map. And then um, how about years ago when you'd pick up the phone and you call the bank and you want to hear your deposit and this funny voice came when it sounded like a robot. Did you ever hear that before? Yeah. Me. <laughs> so I was doing pretty good. And um, then somebody came to me with a formula. And his name was Frank. I'll give you the last name in a minute. And he came up with a formula on he could grow chickens in eight weeks instead of that long-term matured period. And uh, he said, can you design a system that would do that? 
And I did it, and those Frank Purdue chickens are wonderful to these days. <laughs> Aren't they great? So, okay, so Ron did this, and the, the, the thing just boomed and, and moved on. And then I figured, okay, what's next in my career? It was time to divest myself of that interest and move on to another enterprise. And because that interest was, it was growing too fast and had lots of people and lots of headaches and people problems and union problems. So I, got, I sold that company to a large insurance organization and moved on to my new venture. And I had no idea as to what the venture was gonna be. But it was a new venture. And I was calling on customers that were involved in communications because I was very good in, in telecommunications. And when I went to call on this one client one day, I saw something on his desk that was very interesting. It was talking about Western Union bids for excess equipment. And I asked him, I said, what is this? Are you interested in it? He said, nah, you can have it, take a look. Well, being aware, and this is what I started out talking about, I never had a strategic plan. And anybody that tells me they have a strategic plan, I'd like to hear about it because did it really work? Somebody here, tell me. I mean, I'm sure you've had some, I have some business people here, retired business people. Tell me about your strategic plan that worked. I see one shaking their head back there. So I never believed in strategic plans and I didn't know how to spell it either. <laughs> so I picked up this, this piece of paper that was a bid sheet and I figured, okay, I'll go to Western Union and see what it's all about. Well, remember the old, I'm testing your memories now, the old machines called Twix and Telex? Yeah. yeah, well, they were making those available surplus. They would refurbish them and then make them available surplus, and you could bid on them, and if you won the bid, you'd take a truck up there and grab the stuff and bring it home. Well, I started doing that, and I put myself in the surplus Twix and Telex business. Fantastic, and I figured, I'll sell it for 50 cents on a dollar, all these companies that use it, I'll sift out the junk, clean up the good stuff, refurbish it, and I had a business. Then, again, part of my strategic plan that I didn't know how to spell, I get a phone call one day from an organization in Manhattan. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, called the New York Stock Exchange? You heard of it, okay, good. Well, they said, we understand that we went to Western Union and we asked for some machines that we needed that were very special that we used years ago and we're expanding our trading floor. And this was in the 70s. And they said they don't have them anymore. They sold them to a little company in New Jersey. Okay, so they called the little company in New Jersey. And they said, do you have these special machines? And I said, yeah, I've got them. So make a long story short, I sold the machines to them on a full payout lease, a good deal, and I said, okay, what you've got to give me though is the ability, because I paid attention, to service this machines on me, these machines on the trading floor for the life of the machines. And they said, you got a deal. It was great. So now I bought myself a diesel car because gasoline was expensive on the turnpike. And I ran back and forth from exit four on the turnpike, Cherry Hill, to New York every morning to go and make sure that I can service these machines. So we installed them and then I hired a, a man back here in my area to refer, refurbish them and repair them as they would break. And every day I ran around the trading floor with a helper to keep these machines going. So that was my strategic plan at work. And while I was there, I discovered this special institution. New York Stock Exchange was very similar, not to insult you, Howard, very similar to the government. It functioned on inertia. Not, not the present government, though, the old government. So Howard is a very interesting man who's very interested in politics. So I looked around and I said, my gosh, while I'm doing all this business, there's gotta be so many things I can help with these people with. And um, I came up with thing, ideas like program trading and so on and so forth. And it was just one thing after another and it was great. And then in 1983, I discovered that as well as the New York Stock Exchange sold and traded equity, capital, they also traded, sold, and bought and sold bonds, corporate bonds. And I figured, that's great. And they had a corporate bond trading floor that was an auction floor. All these guys throwing their hands up and buying and selling. And I said, well, why are they doing that? Why aren't they doing the same thing that they do with equities and stocks? 
They have monitoring systems. They have little devices at their front end offices. And that's how they trade stock. Why don't they do bonds that way? And they said, well, bonds is an auction crowd. And the upstairs traders, they call down to the auction crowd. And that's where they do the buying and selling. And then they fill the orders back at the offices. And I said, well, that's kind of antiquated. I said, I, I can really automate that. And they said, no, 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 no. We've been doing this for 200 years. We don't want to make any changes. <laughs> OK. I said, how about if you give me a license? I'm going to build a little system. Give me a license to have exclusive rights to build a little trading monitor system for corporate listed bonds. They said, you're nuts. OK, we'll do it. So they gave me a license. And I figured, OK, now I'm going to build this thing. And I had some helpers, and I had some programmers. And I built this neat little system, and it worked. I had one problem. How was I going to sell it? The traders in the offices, they started at 9.30. They left at 4 when the market closed. And these were all the upstairs traders. And if you called them in the morning, you had exactly five seconds to say, I'm either buying or selling, or they'd hang up on you. I figured, how the heck do I? talk to these people. How do I sell to them? So I figured, I've got an idea. I befriended the biggest manager and the largest firm that traded corporate listed bonds on Wall Street. And I went to him and I said, I'm going to give you a system for 30 days, free of charge. I want you to use it. Just use it and let me know what happens. And what I did with the system was the New York Stock Exchange gave me the main feed so I ran that to the broker's office, gave him this little system, and it was interesting because it was nothing more than a little filter box. So the main feed went to the offices, and I built this little filter box that would filter out the bonds of interest for that trader, and he would have quotes and trades, and he would have everything that they had on the bond trading floor. And I didn't know what to do with it because I figured, OK, let him try it. And he tried it. And for 30 days, no one else could top a bond. No one else could top a bid. He won everything. His phone rang off the hook saying, how are you doing this? And they said, well, you need one of these little boxes that Ron Klein and his little company has. And well, my phone started ringing off the hook. So here comes my strategic plan that I never had. How much do I charge for this? How do I figure it out? And this was around the fat times on Wall Street. So I figured, OK, I'm going to form a club. Every trader who's interested has to join my club. And I came up with a number, $10,000. They said, oh, piece of cake. We can make that in a day. And then I figured, well, how much am I going to charge for this box? The box cost me $100 to build. And I said, well, let's see. What's a good figure? I'll triple that, $300. And I'll charge you $300 a month. Wonderful. Unfortunately, it only lasted for about a quarter of a century. So that was my career at the New York Stock Exchange. And it just grew and grew and grew. And we started doing other things and got involved with other exchanges. And uh, it became extremely interesting. So before I go on further, any questions about the New York Stock Exchange and the bonds and the equity? When did the Intel people get in? I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? When did the Intel people get in with their pocket? Much, much later. In other words, great automation came about after I automated the exchange. What happened was the exchange functioned in a very antiquated way in the early 70s, all the way up into the early 80s, because they were still functioning in the old way of with the specialists and just running around the trading floor and having paper piled up three feet on the floor. And then when I started automating, in fact, the first bit of automation that I performed for them was um, program trading which I was proud of, but then it wasn't a great idea. Let me tell you a little bit about program trading. At the, before we had program trading, at the end of every day, just 15 minutes before the stock exchange would close, each trader, each position at the stock exchange had, a sh had multiple shoe boxes with orders in them. Predicated on what was going on in the marketplace, they would exercise shoe box number one or shoe box number 12, and they would run around with these orders take them up to the posts where the stock would trade, and they would execute it. Well, that process called hysteresis is a slow process, because what they do 
when they go to execute the order, it takes time to, to turn that around. And I saw that process and I figured, geez, that's, that's antiquated. I could automate that. Why don't we take PCs, little computers, put all that shoebox information into the PC, and when the head traders would say 15 minutes before the market closed, exercise shoebox number 12, they would push a button that would exercise basket number 12. So all these orders went in simultaneously, and that, unfortunately, is when the Dow started fluctuating. Up 50 points, down 50 points, it was going crazy because everything was simultaneous. So we had to put in what's known today as curbs, that if the market changes in instantaneously more than X number of points, it stops. So I was proud of that, but please don't, don't throw tomatoes at me for doing it. To answer your question about Intel, then I started automating other processes and the video displays and so on, and after a while, larger companies, because the exchange thought I was IBM. Um, and I felt like IBM, but it was a little garage shop. I was really a fire company. I could put out fires faster than anyone else, and that's how I made so much happen. But then the Intels came in and all the other people came in. Yes? Are your patents still viable? My patent for the New York Stock Exchange, or for the credit card, uh, you can only collect on that for the first 20 years, and actually for the first 17 years, because three years, it takes three years for the execution and all the publication go through. And I, I own the patent. My name is on the patent. If you Google me, you'll see all about it. However, the company that I worked for, I had to assign it, and I assigned it to General Telephone and Electric. So my name is in lights, I'm in famous. However, I'm gonna tell you about my new patents that are my own. Everything else is my own and all of my uh, work that I did from the time that I left the New York, the um, credit card thing uh, was mine. But the patents are only valuable or viable for 20 years. In other words, if someone would infringe on a patent and during the first 20 years, then you have the right to a licensing fee. And that goes for all patents. And when they say mostly 17, it's because the first year is usually a provisional patent when it's patent pending, and then the next two years is when the examiners actually have to go in and review your patent and officiate on it and, and award it. So by that time, three years has passed, and then you have 17 years of licensing. Yes? Uh, have you ever done anything with the commodity trading? Yes, I have. Um, after I automated the New York Stock Exchange, I got involved with the Amex, the American Stock Exchange, and then the Commodity Exchange. And all of the functions at the Commodity Exchange, all of the trading that was on the large displays, they were manufactured and provided by my company. So we did the orange juice, the gold, the cotton, and et cetera, et cetera, most all of them. And then we also did the Philadelphia Stock Exchange. So for approximately 26 or 27 years, maybe even longer, I think, we were constantly providing mostly exchange equipment. And here's the interesting thing again. It all came about from reading that bid sheet upside down on the client's desk when I was calling on them. So you have to be able to recognize opportunity when it strikes and take advantage of it. And that's really what I preach. Yes? Since I wrote the book, I'm injecting something here. I think you failed to mention that you provided transparency for over a quarter of a century at New York Stock Exchange. I would like to mention that I have provided transparency for the New York Stock Exchange for over a quarter of a century. Thank you to my lovely wife of 53 years. Uh, that wasn't on my cheat sheet. No, and, and I really don't remember. I was home raising children. But, but since I wrote the book, I got all the facts. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, let me show you the book. I'll, I'll talk about this later because what I needed as I was decided after retirement, after I retired three times and I came out of retirement, I decided I needed a tool and the tool had to be better than a little business card because people would use the business card to pick their teeth, tear it up, throw it away. And I figured if I gave them a little red book to read and it only takes an hour, it would work. It is an incredible tool that has really done major things for me. And the interesting thing is I have trouble with spelling, and I absolutely can't write. So I figured I'm going to put this little tool together, 
and I can self-publish, and I designed the whole thing myself, and my wife is an author and a writer, and I started doing this, and every two minutes, we, we sat across from each other in the office, and I would say, hey, hon, what about this? We did, and after a while, she said, you know what? Give me your so-called manuscript and let me do it. She wrote this magnificent book, and it's called The Grandfather of Possibility. Um, I'm going to backstep a little bit. On the front cover of the book, you see that athlete with a bicycle? Let's talk a little bit about overcoming adversities, and, and I forgot to mention this. I have this inoperable spine condition, and I have spinal stenosis like a lot of others that you have. I have degenerative disc disease, but I have no discs in one through five. So I'm bone on bone. I'm in excruciating pain. See the tears? And I have sciatic pain all the way down to my, my, my ankle. But I train my brain to handle the pain, and I totally ignore it. And by training my brain to handle the pain, and I've always loved cycling for therapy, that I found that when I ride my bike every morning for two hours, and I do about 30 miles, it opens up the facet joints in my spine because I'm riding a racing bike and I bent over, opens up the facet joints in my spine and I'm totally pain free. So with that, it's like when you, you have a toothache and you bite down on it real hard and the pain goes away, I'm whole, I'm great. In fact, I thought I was gonna have to sit for most of my talk. Piece of cake, I can stand, I'm leaning on this. So it's a matter of ignore the pain. Um, if I, I'm inoperable, and the, the surgeon said if I came crawling to them, they would operate on me, but they'd have to fuse my spine. They couldn't really operate because the spinal column or cord is too close to where the stenosis is and I would be paralyzed. So I said, well, I'm active and I want to keep busy. So I ride my bike every day, and I figured while I ride my bike, there's this thing called the Senior Olympics, and you can go into the Senior Olympics and, and try and so on and so forth. So guess what? I'm a senior Olympian, and in 2003, I'm holding the bike over my head because I was Athlete of the Year. How about that? The cripple. <laughs> so thanks for back, back flashing. So <laughs> before I bore, bore you with a little bit more, do you have any questions about the stock exchange or the credit card thing? Now, one thing I want you to remember, when you, um, when you talk to your grandchildren again, say, hey kids, do you know why you have to push the credit card in and pull it out so fast or zap it? No, I don't know. You tell them, well, I know. I'm a smart bubby. It's because we're mimicking a tape recorder. Now, how many knew that before I told you? Nobody? No one knew that? How about that? How about that? Now, so I've been under the radar for a long time because no big deal, you know, I did the credit card thing, I, I didn't become a multimillionaire because, from it, but I did other things and I was successful in other businesses and I was under the radar and then an organization by the name of Napoleon Hill Foundation, have you ever heard of Napoleon Hill Foundation? Years ago, back in 1937, Napoleon Hill wrote the book Think and Grow Rich. It sold 160 million copies in 129 different countries. It was probably one of the most, I, I think it was, he was written um, based around Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie's uh, theory and so on. And Napoleon Hill last year decided that they're gonna come up with the next sequel. There was a book in between written by a gentleman by the name of Greg Reed, who is a member of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. And he was pretty much honored with the position of carrying on that foundation's legacy. And he wrote a book called Three Feet from Gold, which is an interesting book. And that is the name of it, right? Three Feet. Um, it's an interesting story, and I would say get it on Amazon. It talks a little bit about, not a little bit, it talks a lot about this gentleman who was a businessman and back in the days of the gold rush decided, I'm going to go out to California and start digging for gold just like everybody else and become a multimillionaire. So he bought all kinds of mining equipment and went out to California, started mining for gold, and he hit a real good vein. And he was starting to make money. 
and he got his family involved. They bought more equipment. And then all of a sudden, in going through this whole enterprise that he was involved in, the mine dried up. He had no more gold. So he kept going and going. And after many, many months, yes, you heard the story? Oh, after many, many months, he decided to give up. And he quit. And he sold all of that equipment to a junk man for $200. And the junk man said, foolish guy, because the gold mines, you go down so far, and then the strain runs ahead. And what happened was he was just three feet from gold, and that is the largest gold mine in the world. How about that? So the word, the word is stickability. Don't give up. When you're three feet from gold, don't give up. So this Napoleon Hill Foundation, who wrote the book, Think and Grow Rich, contacted me and said, we want you to come out to California. We want to interview you and talk about some, a new project that we have. Please come out. We'll send you a ticket. We'll pay for your hotel. And the funny story is, and here's a real funny story. The day that they wanted me out there, I was scheduled to come here with Judy to speak. And I called Judy, I said, Judy, I don't know what to do. I said, I've got this problem. People want me to come out for business. And I said, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I wrote, owe my allegiance to you. And she said, we'll schedule you for another time. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. I went out there and the cameras were there, the lights, the photographers, they were making a documentary movie of me and my achievements and then making me a chapter in the new book to come out, Think and Grow Rich, Stickability. So if you go on my website, you'll see that. It'll be come out this year. Now, hopefully, the last one sold 160 million copies. It'd be nice if this sold 10 or 15 copies. So, so that, was, that was that story. And then I, I met a couple of very interesting people. One strong, strong... Um, he was a motivational speaker, but he said, Ron, you know, now that you're out from under the road at radar, he said, I'm going to preach to you and tell you something. He said, live life to the fullest and make sure you die empty. So that's what I'm working on now. My wife and I are very involved with a, an, an animal organization, 65 years old, an organization that funds animal health studies. She's been on the board for 21 years with one of our best friends. You may know this lady called Betty White, the golden girl. She's been on for 40 years. So a wonderful organization. I mean, if you, ever, if you want to Google it, Google Morris Animal Foundation or in Denver, Colorado. And we were out at the annual meeting last June. And one of the uh, trustees happens to be the executive director of the guide dog school for the blind. And that's... Seeing Eye, I'm sorry, Morris. Seeing Eye Guide Dog School for the Blind in Morristown, New Jersey. And every executive director automatically becomes a trustee. And this gentleman, who is incredible, happens to be blind. He's a PhD, wonderful dear friend of mine, and Orleans. Um, he was blinded in high school in his senior year in a chemical explosion, lost part of his hand and became blind but is an incredible, brilliant, the most brilliant person I've ever met. And we were having breakfast with him out at the annual meeting, and I'm remembering, Ron, live life to the fullest, die empty. And I was talking to him, I said, Jim, and we were, Arlene got his breakfast, and I was sitting next to him, and I said, Jim, you know, what's on your wish list? What would you really wish for? And I mean, with all the brilliant things you've done, I think he was an executive vice president of AT&T, even while he was, uh, visually impaired. And he said, Ron, I would love to be able to come to a meeting like this or go to a convention and know who I'm talking to without tapping them on the shoulder. I said, wow, what a wish. Just think about that. So I went home, that was in June, and it took me quite some time, and I filed my provisional patent in August. And the patent is for the visually impaired. And what it does it will enable a visually impaired person, blind, 
macular degeneration, I mean any level of visual impairness. To be able to walk up to somebody and look at them and know who they are and say, hi Judy, how are you, without tapping you on the shoulder. Or they can go to their prescription cabinet and look in the prescription cabinet and say, oh, there's my Coumadin and that expires such and such day, great, I'll take that, not aspirins. Or they'll go into their cupboard and they'll say, I think I'm going to have my Concord grape jelly, and there it is. So they can identify anything that they want to identify. And it has unbelievable capability. However, the most important thing to me in, with this invention was that I didn't want to have any influence from an outside source stop me. I mean, you can come up, we can put people on the moon, and by the fact that we can put people on the moon, we don't certainly want to come up with all these newfangled things that are very complex. So I wanted something that was simple, took no influence from the outside world. I could put this together and offer it to a visually impaired person and it satisfied them. So there's two functions that it does. One, when they go to a, a meeting and a, a convention, when the badges are made, instead of having just the name on the badge, it has this special little pattern and the invention has a special pair of glasses with a camera right in the bridge. It looks like regular glasses. It could be with your lenses, it could be sunglasses. It has a little speaker, a little earphone that plugs in your ear, a little camera, connects to your cell phone. The cell phone has the special apps, special programming, so that when you look at something, it identifies it, the special tag, and tells you what it is in your ear. So that when you look at, let's say you bring a prescription home from the pharmacy, you have a sheet of these pre-coded little stick-on labels and you put the label on your pharmacy prescription and you pick up your phone and you say, this is my um, blood pressure medication, take it once a day and it expires June such and such. And it records it. Now anytime you look at that little box, it's going to tell you in your ear what it is. And this thing is really going to be revolutionary. Today, before I came here, was the final, I have my provisional patent. I filed my international and world patent today. So it is officially done. And it will be available hopefully within the next seven months to a year. So <clears throat> that chokes me up because it's dying empty. It's, what, <clears throat> it's what's important in my life to give, and as a senior, to help others is very important. So let's see. Um, oh, the one last instruction I will give to everyone, most important because I'm preaching my philosophy here. Don't stand still, they'll throw dirt on you. Okay? That's my last little word. Of, and. Um, if you're interested, I, I brought a, a couple, uh, like a half a dozen books here, and it has my um, lessons for life in the back, but I don't think the fact that we're all the same, I don't think we need lessons for life. But thank you so much for coming and listening to me. Yes, questions. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, my email is on, there's business cards floating all around. Yes. Um, so are, yeah. This new invention that you yeah. have for the visually impaired, is it going to be priced at a point that will be affordable for most people? I feel so. Yeah. Um, there's going to be parts of it that will be free, but unfortunately because of the construction and the manufacturing of the special glasses, right now it's a targeted price. I'll throw the number out, but it might change drastically and it would be drastically lower. Right now they're targeting the total delivered price at about $290. Right. Yes, sir. My educational background is Philadelphia street kid. <laughs> My, uh, I grew up in Philadelphia uh, during the Second World War and um, I, I was, really had great artistic talents. I, was, I always wanted to be a commercial artist, so I studied commercial art and then went on to the Museum School of Art 
and um, was very good at it from a commercial standpoint. However, if your grandfather wasn't a commercial artist or a, a, an engraver or whatever, you didn't have a, a snowball's chance. And so I was working at odd jobs, and at 18, I was 18 years old, I was drafted for the Korean War. And unfortunately, um, I came back in one piece, but with a couple of holes in me. So um, when I came back, I was afforded the GI Bill, and I, took, I went to Temple University, and I went five years straight for um, electronic engineering. And I specialized in mathematics at the same time, too. During that period, I started a little business on the side, doing some TV repair work to keep me going, supplement from the, uh, the work, from the, uh, the fee that I got from the government. And I was a musician for all these. Who remembers, if you're from New Jersey or maybe close to Philadelphia, the Mummers Parade? I was a mummer. I played the string band. I'm, I'm a guitar player and a tenor banjo player. And at age six, my dad was a player too. I started marching in the parades. I was with all the string bands. So I was a mummer and I, I loved that. So when I came out of the service, and this is interesting how I met my wife, I played the guitar, I played the bass, and I'm also a drummer, a, a timbali drummer. So I started playing at college gigs and things like that to keep my money going so I could get through school. And that's how I met my wife, because my saxophone player was friends with Arlene, and he introduced me to Arlene, and ever since then, for 53 years, stickability, stickability. we're doing it. <laughs> but my background is electronic engineering. However, I taught myself many, many things, and I'm a practical engineer. I'm not, I don't wear one of those funny nerd hats. I don't sit in a chamber saying, oh, what am I going to invent today? I'm a problem solver, so that when something comes in front of me, I'm saying, is it feasible? Is it feasible to solve this without tremendous outside influence from the outside world? For instance, this new patent doesn't require any influence from the outside world. However, if you think about it, we're going to put it on elevators. We're going to put it on menus. We're going to put it on every street post so that when a blind person can walks up to the corner and they'll say, oh, hi, I'm at First in Maine. We're going to put it on every medicine bottle. We're going to put it on every uh, aisle at the supermarkets so that when a blind person walks at the aisle end, he'll say, oh, OK, peanut butter's here, jelly's here, bread's here. They'll know all of that. So it's just more and more things that we might even put it on currency bills. So now they don't have to play little tricks and bend corners with a 5 or a 10. They pick up a 10 and say, oh, I got a 10, I got a 20. So there's unlimited capability. The other thing that we did is the little labels, these little coded labels, they come pre-coded and they're addressed so that when you vo put voice overlay over the label, it goes into your cell phone as memory and then it, it converts the text to speech and you hear that. So with these little labels, what we're going to do now, we, we're making them out of fabric uh, with indelible ink. So when they go to, the, to buy a shirt, a pair of pants, or whatever they're buying, they take this off, put it in a little inconspicuous spot on their trousers or their shirt, and when they walk into their closet in the morning, they say, oh, I think I'll take my yellow shirt with my gray slacks. They know all that. So I mean, that, that touches me. It really does. Uh, well, at first I was going to manufacture and I was looking for funding to go into large manufacturing and I figured that's not really what I want to do because we're being thought of and looked at by some very large corporations that say, we can do that. So well, I'm probably when we're finished with the manufacturable prototype ready for production, we'll license those companies. So I have my company to license this, and the patent um, I own exclusively. I have not assigned it. More questions? Yes. Oh, the other thing that touched my heart. <clears throat> the gentleman, the blind gentleman, that I sat down with at breakfast, and I said, Jim, what's on your wish list? I made him the co-inventor. He shares in everything. Yeah. He's the co-inventor. He signed the patent today, and he's entitled to everything. 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, there's this thing now about you have to be careful because there are people who come along with their Geigers and they can read your cards. And so, for instance, they were selling, and I have all my charge cards in a little metal case where the Geigers can't read into it. Right. Can you talk about that a little what, bit? What what she was saying is that remember I said the magnetic strip on the credit card. It's now 46 years old. The reason it survived. No energy, okay, it doesn't require energy. The only problem with that magnetic strip, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, if you have two credit cards and you put them back to back with a magnetic strip together, one can attempt to magnet, mag magnify the other, not magnify, magnetize the other. So that's why when they make wallets, maybe you can see this, they kind of stagger them so that they're not back to back. So that's the one fallacy with the magnetic strip. But it doesn't require energy. And if it, anything that doesn't require energy cannot radiate. If it requires energy, science, very basic science, tell your grandchildren this, it's going to radiate. So they're coming up with all these credit cards now and little hospital cards and all these other inventive cards with magnetic, with uh, not magnetic, electronic chips, intelligence. So they can put oodles and oodles of data in there. But now it requires energy, so it needs a little flat, you really can't see it, a lithium battery. And if it has a lithium battery and, and energy, it's going to radiate. So somebody can come behind you with a scanner and take that information, lots of information. So now they're saying, oh, well, we'll build little shields. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. One, one other thing I just wanted to add. I say if you need more information, in that magnetic strip, put two magnetic strips on it. Put more information on it. Y yes, over here first. Was there no invention for uh, people with back generation? Okay. Who would have first um, access to that? Where would we go? Case. Would we go to an optical store, a doctor? That needs to be seen. We're trying. To, the question is, where would where would someone acquire? Let's say with macular degeneration, where would they acquire this? There are societies, the Lighthouse for the Blind and other organizations for visually impaired that are thinking possibly of taking this and distributing it, making it available. There are optic companies that might become involved and very interested. So very shortly, once it becomes a commercial product, it'll be available to everyone. It'll be a, a big announcement. Yes? Is your stone deaf? Will this device work? Deaf is not going to work. Well, how do you define stone deaf? I've got two hearing aids, and I'm not stone deaf. I'm sorry? So, uh, can't hear. Let me think. Let me think. Maybe I can invent something. Let me think. There's a device. You know, let me think about that. Let me think about that. Uh, yes, sir. The Israelis are very, very, uh, you know, strong in technology. Have you ever done any work or any type of uh, with the Israelis? No, I haven't. I haven't. I would love to. Remember, my theory is, and, and I don't know if this is the empty bucket, but my theory is I want to give it all. When I'm in that last bed, wherever it is, I don't want somebody to come up to me and say, Ron, you didn't finish. You didn't finish. I want to be ready. Any other questions, technical stuff? What did I miss? Did I miss anything? How about my, my prompt? No? I didn't miss anything? OK. How are we running on time? OK, I, just, I think I consumed an hour. My apologies. Yes? or just that they needed to change the process? I know the market better than anyone there at the exchange. <laughs> you have to. You have to. And that's the nature of whatever I'm involved in. Give you an idea. Um, one of these little patterns I'm talking about for the blind, it ends up that have, some of you have, have probably heard of QR codes. Do you know what a QR code is? Well, you've probably seen a lot of them. It looks like a little 
gray postage stamp with a lot of big dots and so on and so forth. That was invented 10 years ago by the Japanese. And it's interesting. It replaced, not replaces, it's a supplement to the barcode. The barcode is prevalent everywhere, and that can only read up to 20 characters. 10 years ago, a company by the name of Denso Wave, which is a subsidiary of Toyota. See, you're learning a lot today. They're a subsidiary of Toyota. They invented the thing called the QR code, which is a two-dimensional code, that little postage stamp thing that you see on business cards, or they want you to spot it, and so on and so forth. That can store text as well as numerics. And it can store up to like 4,000 characters. You can actually tell it what to store. And there's little generators. Well, it was such a great invention that Denso Wave decided to make it license free. And Toyota has been using it for the past 10 years in manufacturing their cars. And they, just, and they introduced it to the world. And the United States last year decided, hey, what is this fancy little thing? And now they're using it for advertisement. Put it on a billboard, put it on your business card, put it on your, your uh, ARP card or whatever, and it takes you to a, a website. But what the US doesn't realize yet, and this is part of my invention, is that you can take that intelligence and direct it to something else. So the point I want to make here is how you learn rapidly. When I heard about QR codes last year, I didn't know the difference from a QR code to a manhole cover. But I said, Ron, you're a very inventive guy. You gotta learn everything. Learn something new every day. Just like that cow that got out of the car and said, the top is down. So I figured, I'm gonna become an expert. Well, there's nobody that knows QR codes better than I do now because for the last year, I've been working with it. So to answer your question, when I was at the exchange for 26 years, they all knew their own little niche but they didn't understand the whole exchange. And I give talks on bond, fixed income, what the whole thing is all about. And uh, if you ever want to hear that talk, I'll come back and talk about fixed income. But that, that's to answer your question. Any others? Yes. No, not really. I speak to mostly people, and, and I don't concentrate on, on investment information now because I'm really a, um, a problem solver in the area of making things happen. And I don't like to, you know, I've, I've talked about it on radio already and on radio shows. For instance, I'll give you a quick, quick reference. Everybody hears about the Dow Jones. Everybody knows about Dow Jones, right? You have any idea what it is? Okay, let me tell you what the Dow Jones Index is. The most important, more important, what they, what they should emphasize on in TV and radio is the um, Fortune 500 Index, the S&P, okay? Because the S&P really gives you a sample of the Fortune 500 companies and what their reference is with regard to as a, an assembly of a Fortune 500, whether they're doing good, bad, or indifference, it's the average of what all those companies are doing. When they quote the Dow, and all these media people quote the Dow, there's a multiplicity of Dows. There's the Dow Financial Index, there's the Dow Industrials, there's the Dow Utilities, the Dow, et cetera, et cetera. There's about five different Dows. But they only talk about the Dow Industrials. The Dow Industrials is made up of 30 stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. So if IBM plummets, uh, plummets and all the others are doing phenomenal, the Dow's going to look lousy. Well, what kind of reference is that? That's not a reference. Whoever came up with this idea of the Dow Jones Industrial, they should trash it. So when I talk about financial things and financial institutions, I bash a lot because then we get into corporate bonds and all about corporate bonds and what they mean and there's a whole history to that. So that's just one little example, but, but I throw that out as a reference, okay? So don't go by the Dow anymore. <laughs> if the Dow's up or down, it's nonsense, it's noise. It's only 30 stocks that traded on the New York Stock Exchange and it's only 30 of the industrial stocks. It has nothing to do with 
the transportations. Transportation, maybe the airlines are skyrocketing. You don't know anything about that. All you'll know about is that the Dow Industrials made up of 30 stocks are either doing good or bad. Has nothing to do with the S&P index. Okay, anything else? Because I'm in the cookie time. <laughs> Thank you so much to you.